Hey everyone and welcome to our live stream. I am Rachel DeBarros and you are watching Gearhead Diva and today we're going to do a tutorial on how to solder or solder. It really depends on what part of the country you live in. So I know there's a lot of debate about that. So it turns out I did a little research because I've heard it two ways as well. So solder is typically how we say it here in the U.S. But with the L, solder is how you hear it across the pond. So of course my iron is uh, really excited and ready to go. So I'm going to be giving you my own tips, tricks, advice. This is kind of like a beginner's crash course on all the the equipment you need, what's kind of the basic minimum you need to get started, start having fun and fixing and or building your new things. So probably now as I talk, you've probably started to look around and realize, oh my gosh, this is like 360. So you can see parts of the shop that we work in. And if you turn around, if you're watching on your phone or mobile, just scroll, 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 or click and scroll, click and scroll all the way to the back uh, behind you. There's actually a screen where we can show you different angles and a, a couple close-ups so you can kind of see everything that's going on so it's like 360 plus plus so you see my table here full of things and if you're watching on mobile it's probably a little bit easier but I also recommend you guys picking up one of these we do a lot of 360 streams so uh, Google Cardboard or something like this cost 10 bucks you put it on and you can look with your head so you don't get like finger fatigue that's very, very bad. You can't solder and do work with that. All right, so taking a look at my table and we have our live chat going. If you guys have questions or chiming in or maybe you guys have a lot of experience where you're like, wow, here's a great tip. I'll go ahead and let everybody know. So, oh, look at that. So we have McGee, he showed up. Where have you been? Well, I've been celebrating the holidays. So I'm back and you know, ready to do some projects. So on me, on the table here, you see a lot of different things. Now you're not gonna have to use every single one of these to get started. So when I first started, I actually picked up two different uh, soldering irons. We'll go over like the, the irons first. So uh, you'll see that I got my pencil here and this actually turned out to be one of my favorite things. We have our soldering gun uh, here as well a little bit higher powered. So with this uh, pencil, what I like about it are all the different tips. So you can get an idea here for, this is probably the one I use the most. Uh, this tip right here, it's got, you know, nice surface area. You can do like really small to medium sized connections. So for something like this, it sometimes will come with a uh, temperature dial where you can set your temperature there and it plugs directly into the wall. Takes about a couple minutes to get started and switching out the tips is really simple. All it is is just unscrewing it and taking it apart and putting in a new tip. So we'll just get that back on there. And we're also gonna cover cleaning the tip and all of those uh, maintenance issues. So I'm just gonna let him kind of like hang out right here. And probably the toughest part of soldering when using one of these with the temperature dial is actually reading the temperature. Once you can read that and get it set, oh my gosh, the rest is super, super easy. So some X-Men eye vision for this. So this has uh, been my favorite one. It's about 60 watts. But when you move into like automotive or households where the wires are thicker, heavier gauge, meaning they have smaller gauge numbers, and that's one of the things that's, you know, a little bit, it seems like opposite day. The thicker wire is actually smaller gauge number. So a gauge two wire is much thicker than like a gauge 14 wire. So with the soldering gun, now these tend to be higher wattage. Uh, main difference, obviously, shape, but also weight. So for something like this, they're great for automotive, bigger connections. You can see I have different diameter wa uh, wires sitting here on the table. And this one was 60 watts. And if you take a very close look here, it says 140 and 100 watts. It's got two watt settings. It's like... It's like it can't make up its mind or something. Uh, but no, it's actually, you can toggle between the two. So the first thing that people think is higher wattage. That means this one gets way hotter than this one, right? 
Well, not really. Having a higher watt uh, soldering iron just means that this one is much better at maintaining whatever temperature you want than this one. Because if you think about it while you're soldering, well, the ambient temperature is just ripping all that heat from your connection. And so this one at 60 watts has to work a lot harder at trying to keep your tip hot. Whereas this one has a lot more watts in its back pocket and if it's a really windy day or you're just losing a lot of heat because you're working in a cold environment, well it's like, you know, it just pulls it right out of its pocket and adds it right in and it maintains the temperature really well. So for a soldering gun, how do you toggle between the two temperatures? They commonly will have two different settings. And this is the first time, oh my gosh, that I'm going to be super silent. I know, rejoice, right? So if you listen really carefully, you're going to hear two two clicks and that's the two setting it's all about the feel oh, that was so quiet that's another one so i'm gonna hold it right next to the mic and listen so with the first click you would think oh the the further back you pull it the hotter it gets right but it's actually the opposite that first click right there is actually your hottest setting because usually you use it for a very short amount of time and then you let go. Well, with the lower powered, it's a lot easier to hold the gun. You can uh, hold it uh, for long periods of time. Well, it's as much as your, your muscles can uh, take because this is a little bit heavier, tougher to get into those tight spots. But for automotive, if you're putting in new lighting, maybe you're doing um, uh, an alarm system or stereo. So that's something where I use this. Now, just looking at it and comparing the two tips, you'll automatically notice that something is a little off with this tip. And I love buying tools, old, new, anyway. So a lot of times when you buy your soldering iron, you may encounter something like this where you see the tip. It's kind of like, check that out. It's, it's broken. Oh my gosh, what the heck? It's all, it's all broken. And what I found my experience between the gun and the iron is that these tips disintegrate much faster. And I try so hard to keep them clean. It's just the nature. These tips last longer than these, and it just could be because of the wattage and the heat. Uh, so luckily, these are really easy to change out. I just have two uh, Allen holes right here. And sometimes they're screws, and you just need an Allen wrench like this. And go ahead and open them up. And this is kind of another troubleshooting thing because you might find that, wow, my tip looks great. It's nice and shiny, it's ready to go, but it just doesn't seem like it's getting as hot as I need it to get. So the other area you should check is actually wait till it all cools down and pull out your tip. And look at, well, mine's in two pieces now, and look at uh, where it connects. This should be nice, clean it shouldn't be dirty free of any type of corrosion uh, so in this case uh, this would look good other than the whole tip situation so this is kind of ready to be trashed but with something like this you can actually make your own tips too as long as you can find a copper wire of the same diameter and then you just clamp it down you can just make your own tips you know as long as you want uh, which are much more an expensive option than having to buy them again. I found that these tips over here for this soldering iron are a lot less expensive, um, but they also last longer as well. So a higher powered, much better at keeping the temperature type of gun, but heavy. Uh, you do have to wait between joints because anytime you put it down and you are not holding that trigger, it starts to cool down. But it takes so, so like no time for it to get fired back up again. Whereas with the iron or the pencil, I just leave it at that temperature all the time while I'm working. And then when I'm done with it, I just uh, unplug it. So we've covered some irons. The last one on the list is the soldering station. Now this is kind of the next level that I'm moving into because after using the different type of irons, and I recommend you do the same. You don't have to go out and buy all of them. You can just borrow one from a friend. Most uh, automotive shops have something like this lying around for you to play with. So uh, find a buddy that wouldn't mind you uh, having a little bit of fun. And with the soldering stations, uh, the only difference really is that this plugs directly into the wall. So basically all of your heating components 
are right here to make it work. So you'll find that these soldering irons tend to be fatter around the grip, which is fine. It gives you like nice, you know, control. But with the soldering station, it runs and plugs into a power unit. Now, the nice thing about that is that if you think about it, it's like division of labor. So these pens can get really thin so you can get very precise work done and you can control everything you need with that uh, power station. So temperatures, all that, and they're usually higher wattage. So it does a much better job of maintaining heat on that tip and then on your connection as well. So you don't have to sit there forever and then potentially damage your connection with excess heat. So the soldering station, it's only, I would say $20, $30 more than any one of these. So I really recommend if this is something that you're really thinking about getting into and you're like, yeah, I, th I think I can, you know, splurge that way. Definitely go with the soldering station. And I've given you my own pros and cons. Um, you know, a lot of pros, it just really depends on the kinds of projects that you're doing. If you're going to do primary uh, primarily automotive, I really recommend the gun. But if you're doing a lot of fun RC cars, fun hobby projects, your soldering pencil or station is probably the way to go. So I think that is all of uh, the iron talk that I can do. And then we have Johnny saying that the mini torch iron is my way to go for tight uh, spots and vehicles. That is very true. Uh, the one thing we're not covering here is the butane ones. You know, obviously not electric. When you go on the job, you don't always have access to an outlet. So those are really, really great. But in the shop, I pretty much stick with the electric ones. Uh, got a couple of hellos. We have João Carlos uh, from Brazil. So hola, como vai? So thanks for joining the stream. And then butane soldering torch works pretty good for heavier gauge wire and there's uh, no no cod to get in the way. Um, true. So I'll have to play with some butane as well, but I haven't been in an environment yet where I don't have uh, an outlet. So that kind of covers our irons. If you guys are watching on replay, well, we're going to fast forward into the future and we're no longer live. Continue putting your comments uh, down because I'm there all the time. We keep the conversation going long after this stream has passed. So we talked irons. Next thing that um, this was the part that kind of combobulated me the most, which is types of solder. So here I have three of them right here and you'll notice really the first thing you'll notice is the difference in thickness so you'll see that this one is much thicker it's probably my thickest one for bigger connections and then you have this little guy here uh, he's very thin great for circuit boards and things uh, and then this one is actually the exact same one as this one but it comes kind of in a nifty you know little nerdy pen you know pocket pen thing um, so I've used this one as well plus I like the uh, the tight coil uh, that it comes in sometimes a little more uh, convenient to use there so we're just gonna pop him back so the first mistake I made um, well it's not really a mistake it's actually preference and I really found my preference early on you can get uh, lead solder or solder depending on where you live uh, or you can get um, unleaded or lead free so as I was looking at the store well of course kind of the first thing I saw was lead free I went for it because if you think about it, it's, you know, environmentally friendly. You're also touching this a lot and you're getting like lead particles on your hands. That can't be good. And you're also heating it a lot. And so I went with the lead free option. And what I quickly found was that it is harder to use because it just doesn't liquefy as easy as the lead kind. So as soon and I just kept trying and I kept getting like gloppy joints and I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And I kept putting more heat and more heat on it until I tried the leaded kind and first time in wow it just worked so the biggest difference um, as well like you can tell that this spool is totally unlabeled so how the heck do you know if this is leaded or not well two ways one of course is the weight leaded is definitely going to be heavier than your uh, tin counterpart and it's not all lead it's usually a ratio as you can see here 60 40 so 60% tin, 40% lead. Uh, the other way to tell is the way that it dries. Uh, so you can see here, I'm going to turn this around. I made a couple bad solder joint examples for you guys. So I'm going to show you guys here first. You can see that it dries or, or cools uh, to a very shiny a chrome type of finish. 
kind of like those uh, 1950s uh, bumpers with lead free it'll it'll uh, cool to like a brushed aluminum looking like a brushed metal uh, so it'll look a lot duller um, I like the chrome I think it looks really great on circuit boards like all shiny like you know you're a mad scientist or something like that so if you're a beginner I definitely recommend going with the leaded variety the 6040 um, you're gonna learn much quicker uh, than trying to use the lead free but those of you that have lead free I'm not saying don't get it and don't ever try it and it's the worst thing in the world definitely post your comments uh, because it's you know a lot of people love it and they swear by it and, and they use it I just you know we just didn't jive it wasn't a good first date so here we've had many dates and many cool projects uh, that have come out of it so the other thing you want to look for in your solder is whether or not it's got a core so some of it is uh, solid uh, so you want to look for something that is rosin core versus acid core acid you don't want it already sounds bad mixing electronics and acid acid core is for plum plumbing work as is silver solder so you want to reserve all that stuff for your plumbing household needs so with your solder look for something that has a rosin core and if you look again at this label right here you'll see the two percent so you know that two percent uh, rosin core there now it's really tough to see you know just by looking at it if, if it's got a core you know or not if you guys have very uh, young inexperienced eyes you can look at yourself but uh, for those of us with mature experienced eyes you know we're, we're just gonna stick with the label so 2% rosin, and so what, what's this rosin core business? Like, what does it do? Well, when you heat up your iron just by itself, the first thing you're gonna notice is that the tip starts to get really, really black. And well, you don't wanna solder with that because that's oxidation, contamination, and now you have a weaker connection. So how do you clean the tip? Well, that's where the rosin comes in. It helps remove all that oxidation. So as that melts with the solder, and that's got a lower melting uh, temperature than the solder itself. So as you see those fumes coming, that's actually your rosin core cleaning all that oxidation that's building up, cleaning any of the contamination away. Uh, and so that's what the fumes are. They're actually not lead fumes. Your uh, iron would have to burn way hotter for that lead to, like, become in a, in a gaseous state so that's not going to happen but you definitely want some ventilation to blow that away from you so rosin core now if you're working with a solid core that's fine too or if you're having a lot of really dirty tips or you haven't used your tip in a long time and you really need to clean it i also recommend getting some rosin paste so you have it in the core it comes in a paste form you can also get it in a liquid form it even comes in like little droppers where you can get into really tight spaces so something like this it just looks like peanut butter mmm delicious uh, so you can see a couple jabs in there and I primarily use this to clean tips yeah if I haven't soldered in a while and I just really want to give the tip a good cleaning also if you're working on a connection say automotive that's gonna be under the hood or exposed to the elements you want to go in as clean as possible so you can actually take your wires and dip it in and then solder and you'll see it builds up a lot of smoke as it burns away all that oxidation and uh, dirt and all that uh, and then you put uh, some heat shrink over it and then you have a really well protected uh, connection so we've covered our solder lead versus lead free if you're just starting out I recommend the lead rosin 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 all the time stay away from the acid stuff if you're doing electronics we talked a little bit about our heat shrink tubing we're gonna put that aside you always want to put that on before you get started uh, so that way you don't like look at this I have an infinity loop and can you imagine if I had to get uh, some uh, heat shrink I'd have to start over now this infinity loop is a couple more good examples of what not to do and that was probably the whole fun of putting this together all right so we have some more uh, coming in uh, some more comments and things so keep them coming um, just got a complete bumper to bumper auto wire kit I could really use some help oh my gosh those are so much fun so uh, Pete Cologne best of luck to you definitely post in the comments if you get stuck somewhere we're all gonna jump in and help you out even those of you working or watching on replay 
let's all help Pete out. So I'm putting this heat shrink away for now. We're just gonna, you know, put them over there. Uh, so finally, the third main thing that you're gonna need is a way to clean your tip. I've already talked about, you know, cleaning tips and all that and keeping them real um, uh, clean from uh, contamination. So there's two main ways you can do that. And I'm gonna turn this around for all of you guys, get this out of the way. And you can see some chrome uh, bits going on here. So you can see I've been using the, uh, the leaded here. And we'll talk about work surfaces in just a bit. But for tip cleaning, most commonly people use the little damp sponge. You know, you just dip it in there, you tin your tip, which we're gonna do, and then you just rub it. But some people, and it just, when, if you think about it, the iron is so hot. I mean, it's just burning. And then when you rub it on something cool and damp, well, that's kind of a thermal shock. And I think that's where you get this situation going on right here. You know, that thermal shock. It'll actually degrade your tip a lot faster. So if you're a hobbyist, you solder, solder once in a while, this is, I think, the way to go. Really simple. You know, you're not overly using it for, for projects day in and day out. Uh, but then I kind of jumped to this, and this is called a brass tip cleaner. And it works very similarly. Now, the advantage of a brass tip cleaner, obviously, sponge, you can get it home for, like, no money. Brass tip cleaner, something like this, is going to run you about 10 bucks, And you can see it's pretty small. It's, it's compact. And the idea between the brass tip cleaner is that you stick your soldering iron or gun tip in here, and it's not really going to change the temperature of your tip all that much. You don't get that thermal shock. Also, these brass shavings do a really great job at cleaning the tip while being pretty mild on them. Now one thing you should never do is if your tip is really black take sandpaper or steel wool to it that really just starts to degrade it further now i am telling you this but that doesn't mean that i have not done it and do it myself uh but i have seen the effects of it your tips really just don't last as long so that's when i started jumping to the rosin paste use something like this instead because you'll dip your your tip in there throw some solder on it and you'll just start seeing that dirt and grime and blackness just wash away the more and more you do this so sometimes you'll have to do it like five seven times to get the tip clean whereas it's so tempting Oh, is it tempting to take that little really mild sandpaper and just, eh, eh, you know, get it clean that way. So don't do it. Definitely go the rosin paste way. So we talked about uh, tip cleaners. We can talk about uh, work surfaces. As you can see, I am working on a very basic uh, plastic uh, child's hobby folding table. It's really easy to just kind of put in the corner when you're not using it. Uh, and so when I first started soldering, I kind of envisioned it like Sigourney Weaver was going to come in and like it's going to, the solder is going to be like the alien saliva and it's going to melt through and melt through on my legs. And oh my gosh, it's actually not that way at all. I solder, solder, depending on where you live, uh, right on this table and as you can see it's not like it even sticks once once it cools you can kind of just pick it right off and you're done with it so one of the things that I like to keep though if you have a 12 by 12 piece of ceramic tile uh, this is definitely going to make your life easier in case you accidentally kind of rest your tip it'll definitely burn this table I really don't care about how this table looks some of you are working on really nice wooden workbenches so you definitely don't want to start to scar that up so a piece of tile from the hardware store really cheap just pick up a, a cheap 12 by 12 I actually use this fine leopard coaster right here and you see a bunch of solder on it and the first idea this kind of looks like like wow you're leaking a lot of solder but I'll show you what I use this for and, and kind of like why this is all looking the way it is so this is quite convenient here so all right we covered irons we covered solder we covered how to clean your tip and now i think finally we should probably cover like what the heck these contraptions are here well you need a way to kind of hold your project so you're not you know doing it on your table like this so this is also called a helping hands you know it's a little guy here and he'll hold your piece you know while you're trying to 
connect the joint. And these alligator clips are quite mild. Uh, if you have like great white shark teeth on yours, you might want to put a little bit of electrical tape so that way it doesn't serrate right through the your, your insulation there. And then now the environmental elements start coming in, corrosion, shorts, all that fun stuff. But you can kind of see how this works. It just holds your connection so you can work on it there. Now this one comes with an extra special uh, attachment. I'll put links to all this down in the description as soon as we're done. And those of you watching on replay already have them, uh, those of you that are zapped into the future. So with this one, what I like about this one is that it actually does come with a magnifying glass attachment that you can put on here, right? And then um, you can uh, see what you're doing. And it's, it's, it's also kind of like a safety uh, shield as well. I've never really had solder uh, splatter up on me, but it can happen, hence the, uh, the safety glasses. So I'm taking this off because it's gonna make this really tough for you to, guys to see what's going on. But this does come with that attachment. You can get it with or without. Um, but say you're in a pinch and, and you're like, you know, I wanna get the iron, I wanna get this. Um, there's, you can make your own holder check this out so this is a paint can top you know just like a rattle can top and what i've done was cut little v's in them like that see little v's and then all you have to do is say you have your uh, connection here ready to go i'll just use this guy as an example you just slip it right in and it holds it and you go ahead. So one of the things that you can also do is cut a U here. It really depends on the gun that you're using. Like this one is pretty easy to just go right in there and solder, real, real simple. Um, but say you have to get like a gun like this in there, a little bit tougher. So you might have to cut uh, a U or helping hands is helpful, um, even using them in the car with a magnetic base or something. So uh, paint can works just as well as this little guy, but you know, he is missing the, the magic eyeballs. So I'm gonna put him aside and we are almost ready to get uh, started. I think I kind of covered everything that's on the table. Obviously we have our wire cutters, uh, the sharper the better. Uh, these guys have seen some action, but I continue to uh, use them. I always like a tool that's uh, looking a little uh, worse for wear because they, oh, you know what they say, a knight in shining armor means that this is a knight that has not seen battle. It's, it's whose armor has never been tested. So when you find uh, my little knight here, his armor's been tested, so we stick with him. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have a different gauge wire, and like I said, the lower the number of the gauge, the thicker the wire. So you can uh, look here. This is something that you would probably find in an automotive kind of realm for different projects. Like this is a, a 14 gauge, I believe, and you can see kind of the, the thickness of it here as we compare to an 18 gauge. Now you can see that this is much thinner here. And I can show you guys uh, over here as well on the back screen uh, there. So you can see it's much thinner. So I highly recommend if you're soldering for the first time, um, I'm going to put this aside to start with something that is a higher gauge number, meaning a thinner uh, wire. They're a lot easier to bend and make joints and really practice how much solder to put uh, on your joints. So for something like an 18 gauge like this, you can easily use uh, a soldering pencil or soldering iron. For your uh, 14 gauge or lower, that's kind of when something like this starts coming in uh, more handy. So I'm gonna go ahead and release my infinity. This is like my infinity electric. You just hook onto any one of these and it's like you got power forever because it just keeps going. <laughs> All right, so he'll sit over there and I'm gonna roll you up and put you here. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of put him aside and get rid of this uh, soldering gun uh, because we kind of went over how to use him. And I'm gonna be guessing that uh, most of you guys are gonna fall in this kind of category. A lot of household electronics, radios, kids' toys, RC cars, um, a decent amount of automotive with something like this, especially if you get a soldering station, then you start to cross categorize a little bit better. So I'm gonna plug this guy in, uh, let him start to warm up here while we talk about uh, joints. So it takes a couple minutes and so I'm just going to bow down not quite disappear from you guys, just, you know, kind of. So again, you can see the little light is on right there. And now starts the most impossible task of soldering, which is trying to determine a good temperature. So I'm going to leave him low, um, you know, 
Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about. We're backing up here. <laughs> y'all know. <laughs> so hit in the comments if, if you do the same thing. So I'm just going to leave this on its lowest setting for now, and I'm just going to put him uh, aside. Let's see. We're just going to cross the wire over me because that's safety, and safety is number one. <laughs> All right. So you sit over there. And so I have just kind of these, and you can see that I've stripped them um, way long, like way too long. You don't have to strip them this long. It's helpful when you're first getting started because you have a lot to work with and you kind of don't run out of room. Uh, also, a little bit easier for demonstration purposes. So I think... All right, so for this one, there's a couple different joints that we're all used to making. So uh, come close here, face me if you're facing the back wall there. Turn back around, scroll, scroll, scroll. I'm right here. So probably the ones that you're used to seeing in light sockets and things like that is your pigtail. You know, so I like to take these and really take these little straggly strands and roll them up. Now, we didn't really go uh, into detail about how to strip these. Um, just really quickly, you'll notice that there are holes with numbers on them. So you, this is obviously uh, 18 gauge. It says so on the label. If you can't really tell the label, uh, you can use the depths of the holes and see which one matches up, and then that's your, your gauge. So same thing if you guys want a closer look. Scroll to the back of the room on the TV there. You can see the different holes. And... You can tell, well, that's too big, and that's too big, and you just keep going down the line until you find one that snugs really, really well, and you cut and strip. The other thing you want to be really mindful of, um, so it really doesn't matter where you're looking now, is the amount of strands. So if you cut one end, and then you cut the other end, and it turns out that one end has way more strands than the other, you want to recut, because even if it's missing just a few strands, that makes a huge difference. You start building up resistance in the connection so give it another cut doesn't uh, cost anything to do that so we talked about the pigtail connection which is what you see in electrical sockets this connection is great for wires that are not going to be under tension like they're not going to be pulling on each other or anything like that so the way to make that obviously is I like to start you know at the bottom and then you twist the wires around really tightly um, and then you cap it off with your your wire nut. Now I'm not going to do that here because the more you misshape the wires kind of the tougher it is to uh, wind them. So let me get these all nicely wound up and I'm going to switch to the other sides where you see the ends are all scraggly. So the other way to make your connection is to kind of get them scraggly, kind of like they just woke up out of bed, you know, from a rough night and some, some hair there. And what you're going to do is kind of get them to meet. You know, like a little first date, they're feeling each other out. So um, seeing if it's a good match. And so once you get them intermeshed, you can go ahead and twist them and twist them as tight as you can. Twist those little intermeshings. Now, definitely not my favorite uh, type of connection because you don't want your solder to be really the only thing holding this together or doing a bigger job at holding this together than the actual wires you want it to be mechanically strong without it without solder uh, so see how i can pull that apart that needed to be wound way way tighter in the mesh form so i'm going to show you the uh the joints that i like the most it's called the lineman's joint or the Western Union joint. And this is uh, another really familiar one. Um, so I'll show you guys here real close up. So basically, you take your, your wires, you make them super tight. And what I like about this joint is that these wires can be tight. It's really made for wires that you're going to hang something off of it. It's, it's going to be really taut. There's going to be tension on it. So the goal, um, especially for really important applications like aviation and NASA and all that, you want to try and get three lines across it. So make an X and I like to kind of start towards the bottom, you know, of the X. And the other reason I have them super long is so hopefully my fingers totally don't get in the way, but it looks like that was futile because I'm getting in the way. So you want to um, bend one over the other and then you want to start to wind them. And you'll see this better in, in a bit um, because my whole long wire theory, so you guys could see them better uh, didn't didn't work out as well so let me see if I can do this in a way that you guys can see it much better all right it may not be possible but anyways we are starting with our little X and 
So you just join them like that. And I'm going to start with this one. Do one at a time. And my goal here, if you guys can see this, is to run them as tightly wound as possible. So if you look at the little humps between them, there's no space. There's no gap. They're touching each other uh, versus kind of loosely um, winding them. This gives them the best mechanical strength. So here I am going and doing the other side. And let's see if I got my three winds. That would be amazing if I did. All right, so you can see that little joint there. It looks like I was able to get three winds going because I hear that's NASA standards. Also NASA standards, it's pre-tinning uh, your wire, but that makes them a little tougher to turn. So we're, you know, we're not building uh, rocket ships here, but you can see, look how strong that is already. So we don't even need solder on that to keep it strong. The, the solder is just now gonna work on having a good connection. So if you guys turn around uh, to the other side, I'm going to do this one real quick so it's ready and we can do our infinity, um, our infinity electrical here. So this guy was already turning this way. We'll just keep them turning this way. So we'll have a uh, kind of two joints to look at. And this one's like really long. I went crazy with the, uh, with the. All right, so turn around, scroll, scroll, scroll here to the back. Uh, so we have our X here, and all I'm going to do is kind of start towards, uh, start towards the bottom. And you want to try and get them kind of equal length. In a normal uh, setting, you would probably cut these about an inch. You know, this is way more than an inch, uh, what I did. Uh, it's just to kind of make it a little bit easier to, for you guys to see. There we go. And then I'm going to do the same here, where we're just going to wind this thing as tightly coiled as we can. And I'm going to get way more than three turns here, only because this thing is so long. <laughs> so, the, uh, so now that we have our turns, the only thing that we want to inspect is these little scragglies at the end. You want to try and tuck them in as much as possible. And that's where I have this tool, where you can really mash them down, making sure that they're not poking out and potentially poke through your shrink wrap or your shrink uh, tubing that you're going to put them on top of it. And then your environmental elements start to get to it. So as you touch it around, it should feel pretty smooth. You shouldn't really catch anything on your fingers. So that's feeling pretty good to me. And you can see this one is way off to one side there, um, but that's okay. Uh, one of them was way longer than the other. We're gonna keep them, you know, give them some love. All right, so the iron has been heating over here uh, for quite some time. Move some of this stuff out of the way. And just, you know, being mindful that it's hot. So I think the way I'm going to do this first is to turn these arms sideways. He's going to put his hands up in the air sometimes, saying, hey, yo. And I'm going to uh, put the connection up here, which is going to be a little bit weird for me, but I think that you guys will be able to see it uh, much better uh, this way. It's uh, better than perhaps I can work this way for you guys as well. We'll see. We'll try both. It's going to be super awkward. but <laughs> All right. We'll move if we have to. So first I'm going to secure this little guy just like that. Get him going. I'm going to bring my uh, brass cleaner. I also have my sponge here. And this is where our tile comes in and why I like this tile. So... Um, basically we're going to clean this tip because in the time that I've been talking to you, it's been on its lowest setting, but look at it. It's already kind of like tarry looking. Well, not tarry looking, but like bronze, you know, and this is not a, a steampunk episode. So this bronze here is, is not really good. We want this super, super shiny. So we can dip it in the rosin. Uh, but the first thing I like to do is grab some of the solder here. Let's get it started. Sometimes it's easier to um, unwind quite a bit, put it around your finger so that way you're not kind of working with uh, this awkwardness. So the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of stick this in here. If you're only working with a sponge, go ahead and, and, and go the sponge route as well. So listen, they both work. So you can see that we're already starting to kind of clean that off. But the most important part of cleaning is we need that rosin. So this is where I have this kind of situation going. And you don't need like a giant thick um uh thick bit and in talking to you guys i got like so excited i forgot to turn my fan on so let's pop that 
fan on. Watch, watch this magic happen. The fan is just gonna like totally come on. So a couple of safety tips while doing this. Um, so you definitely want to work in a well ventilated area because that rosin smoke that you guys just saw it's nasty to smell it's also not that great for you so we have the fan going um it doesn't have to be a huge beefy fan like you see in the corner that's my regular shop fan you can have just a simple table fan that'll do too remember you're working with lead so try not to scratch your face and this is like when my nose is like oh my god it wants to be scratched so much and also safety glasses like i said i never really had solder splatter up on me but it can happen uh, when you're working on the joint so before we get to the joint though uh let's go ahead and i'm going to turn this up y'all know what i'm doing all right so let that start heating and i'm just going to dip this in like you don't have to go all crazy in there just poke it poke it you know like you're testing like a, a beef or a roast or something for the right temperature but look look at how shiny that's already getting that's already looking pretty good and so this rosin here, a core, sometimes I like to start with this thicker one to, to clean this off because it's thicker, it's faster. Uh, so all I'm gonna do is just, um, plus it'll give us a good idea of how hot this is getting. Like, are we ready or, you know, yet or not? You can see how the fan is kind of blowing it, well, towards you guys <laughs> and away from me. So uh, you can see that it's still kind of like a little, maybe a little bloppy. Um, that means that the iron is still, you know, achieving its temperature. And I'm going to go ahead and continue poking, poking. But it's kind of nice to have this safety uh, of this uh, coaster, this fine uh, leopard print coaster. And the other thing I do, uh, thing I do is just slap my hand down on the table. Solder is heavy, so it's just gonna fall right down. It's not gonna like splatter or anything. So when we get ready to do the connection, what we're gonna do is tin the tip. Tinning just means putting a small layer of solder on the tip. So we kind of get it ready. That solder's already there. It helps to warm the joint. It's got a little bit of rosin on it. So it's going to prevent that oxidation uh, from happening. So now this is the only time that your solder should directly be touching the tip. No other time should this be happening. And I'll show you uh, what I mean. So let's get that nice and done. So let's do our final tinning and then slap the uh, excess. You can also put the excess in the uh, tip cleaner or on the sponge, just wipe the excess off. Me, I just like to slap it right on the tile. So we're gonna go ahead and let that uh, roll for a little bit. And with the solder, don't touch it to the tip. Go on the other side of the connection and all we're gonna start doing is um, touching it. You know, see if they're happy together and see how it immediately starts uh, melting and the nice thing with this is that it melts right into the connection it really should feel like a candle wax and as soon as you're done with the solder remove the tip unlike I did I was talking to you guys <laughs> way busy so you want to remove the tip and the type of joint you want is one that is totally covered it looks nice and silver and um, chromey chromey uh, but you can also see the strands in the actual wire uh, because if, if you glop it on there too much, then you can get something that breaks. So this is really what it should look like. I'm going to slide it, uh, you know, on the other side of the table. It's like you guys are sitting on the opposite uh, side of the table uh, with me. So you want to definitely let your connection completely cool before you start handling it. Uh, because if it cracks, well, now you have a weak connection and you're going to have problems down the line. So we're just going to really let this cool for a little bit as I slide it kind of towards you guys to take a closer look at it. So because this is kind of for, for demo here, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get this off. Normally let it cool for about a couple minutes. But you can uh, already look at it. You can see that it's fully covered in the solder, but yet you can see the strands. So it's not overly uh, gloopy gloppy. And I'll show you guys here on the back of the room, if, if you guys were looking at the back of the room here, what it looks like. So nice, shiny, kind of chrome look and feel. And um, it just sucks the solder right in. And this is the biggest difference between uh, lead and lead free. The lead free just kind of sat up on the top like, hey, I'm just hanging out and it just doesn't penetrate 
uh, the connection. So that was a little bit frustrating. So now we're going to try again, um, go to the back of the room for, for a view of this. We're going to try this connection here that's a little bit off to the side, but you know what? It's, it's for practice, so he's good enough for practice. <laughs> All right. So let me go ahead and get this down here. And you can already see the, the iron's been sitting there, and it's wanting to turn um, black, that tip. I'm going to place my... Uh, my little thing there and if you're working with a larger piece of tile probably a little bit easier uh, to do but this is just so easy to store I have a whole bunch of them I'm gonna put that guy right there we have our solder my little tinning solder or for automotive wire something a little bit thicker I'm gonna keep these guys here so again we have our connection going so again heat from the bottom side, you always want your iron and your solder to be on opposite sides. This is also true for breadboards and circuitry. You always want, no matter how tiny that little uh, lead coming from the resistor, that's where you switch to one of these tiny little points. You heat just that little point, and as soon as that solder covers, pull them both apart. Um, so that way you don't overheat the connection. So as you guys can see here on the back of the room, you can see that this tip is already looking bronze. We're back in the bronze age. So <laughs> we're gonna uh, go ahead and clean that before we get started. Let's just kind of get the excess off um, by stabbing my little brass here. Or, you know, some of you may, may wanna use your, your um, sponge, your kitchen sponge. Wanted to take it with it. So just by doing that, you can already see it's already getting much, much better. So let's just start to clean the tip before we get started again. And, sorry, blowing that, that uh, fumes your way right at you guys. Oh my gosh, I am super, super rude. <laughs> Fire up your fans at home. <laughs> that way you don't smell it. All right, so you can see how shiny that's already getting. We're going to hit this up a couple more times. It might be a little excessive but you know all right so it looks like we're ready to go it, it's looking pretty pretty shiny there and my little guy's kind of falling asleep here wake up there all right so we're gonna go ahead and tin the tin uh, tin the tip say that five times fast and again as soon as you're done tinning the tip you only want a thin layer of solder so either wipe it stick it in there or do what I do, slap, and now you're ready to go. So we're gonna stick this on the bottom here and we're gonna let that just start to heat up the connection and we're gonna start poking and testing, the poke and test. So, and it helps if you uh, don't move your iron around like I am because I'm in an awkward position for you guys. So we're just gonna keep that there and every time it moves, we're losing our heat. Um, and then just poke around eventually it'll it'll start seeping in there and you can see my uh sh shop fan going this is where like a higher wattage iron will really help out so that we don't have that heat dissipating on you this is taking a little bit longer because i'm in a real funky position um heating this wire in a position you guys can see actually let me switch this guy because it will over It'll over solder. Look at the size. Look at the thickness. Uh, now that you guys can see on this side, it's as thick as the wi the wire. Um, in talking to you, I did not switch wires, so that would have overcoated this connection. So that's actually kind of good that that happened. So we're gonna switch to something like this, which is smaller. It doesn't necessarily. It, it means it melts faster because solder is still gonna melt at you know its temperature, um, which I believe is like 188, something like that. So let me retin a little bit here with this big guy and then I'm going to immediately remove him so I don't start using him again and I'll just all right and find a much better way to try and do this in this angle for you guys if not then I'll just kind of move it a little bit in a, a slightly more comfortable position for me not for you <laughs> so I'm going to let that guy heat up. And again, you only want to use enough heat to melt the solder and, and get a good connection. Uh, otherwise, we're working with wires now. Um, they can definitely take more heat than, say, delicate circuit board components. But at the same time, you don't want to fry the wires. Um, and you want to try and keep your iron as still as possible 
without uh, applying pressure to the the joint. Um, and if mine keeps slipping around, then I may just uh, do a different position. But we're just going to poke around. Eventually it gets hot enough that it starts to melt just like that. And that's our rosin working. Anytime you see smoke, that's the rosin core. So, and you see that the solder never touches the tip while we're making the connection. Never ever, only for tinning purposes do they ever uh, touch. So, now that that's done, first thing uh, I'm gonna do with the connection while it cools is just kind of take care of your tip because these last a long time if you take care. So do a final tinning. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the excess. Just kind of hang out here, you know, for a bit. And I'm gonna turn the temperature down on it, which I believe is this way on the dial. So I'm gonna let that uh, connection sit for a bit. And that one's also looking nice and shiny. I'm gonna see if I can bring it up to the back of the room here. So you can see what it looks like. You can see all of the strand on it um, and it's still coated all the way. And you wanna flip it over too because you wanna make sure that that solder has come all the way through from the top to the bottom. It should wick right by itself. You really shouldn't have to sit there jamming it or, or anything like that. And again, work in a, co in a position that's comfortable because if your iron tip is moving around like mine was, it just doesn't heat uh, and you're gonna be fighting it. The things I do for you guys. See? <laughs> All right, I love y'all. So here is our uh, connection, and, and as I turn it, you can see it's uh, uniformly silver, you know, uniformly chrome. So we have part of our infinity loop going on here. So this is, uh, these are kind of examples of good joints. So if you're facing the back of the room, spin back around and face me, and now we're sitting uh, face to face. So this is an example of, of a good joint. It You see silver all the way around. You can see the strands, uh, the individual strands. It shouldn't be looking gloopy gloppy. So I'm gonna put this down. Normally you wanna let it cool a little bit more before handling it, but you get the idea. You guys are already catching on. So here are some examples of really bad ones. And I'm going to go ahead and just unplug this because it's, it's giving me a funny look like you're going to slide your hand up in there. <laughs> so you can just hang out over here. So uh, here's some examples of some uh, bad ones. And I'll show you guys here up front first. So here we have one that just didn't coat all the way. Like if you really look under under the underbelly, if you will, uh, it's still very coppery looking, still very brassy coppery. Uh, this one, you can definitely see that when I run my fingers on it, it's super sharp. That is just gonna catch on you every which way. And then this one is a cold joint. See how it's all gloopy gloppy? And this is especially bad. Do you see that little bubble back there? Well, that means that your solder didn't melt enough. And this is the type of thing you see when the person solders. And I'll just bring out my little helping hands here for a sec. Because um, this is probably the biggest uh, beginner mistake that I see. Other than maybe not choosing the right types of solder and, and the wrong gun when you're working with a huge gun trying to make these joints. Is that they'll actually take the solder and go like this on top, either in the air, they'll sit there and try and gloop it on top. It'll never penetrate all the way down to the bottom. Um, or they'll kind of run it along the top like this together, the solder touching the iron, and then they run across like that. Well, number one, your rosin doesn't do a good job of really penetrating that joint because when your solder comes from the top, well, that rosin and that solder just come all the way through, just cleaning everything. So you definitely don't want to do this type of thing or kind of dragging it like I call it caterpillar style, just, you know, across the top uh, of your joint because that's what you get. You get these gloops and glops that don't really, you know, in the end, they're not going to last and they don't look uh, real good. Well, looking good is the, the least of your scenario or what you want. You want it to work, right? Put all this time into it. Um, so for people in the back of the room, um, you can probably get a much better view of our gloopy glops going up here using the caterpillar method. Uh, and that's uh, my, my term there, TM, TM. 
Uh, here we have a couple barbs coming out because I didn't uh, press down uh, these little ends. So that can uh, go right through my shrink tubing. And then here you can see a lot of copper that the um, solder didn't penetrate enough. So I like, you know, this is also the, the heavier gauge wire. So you can see a much better uh, connection, you know, a much better one on the heavier gauge there. Um, I didn't do the entire uh, thing, but you get the idea. Look for the strands kind of coming through. It should just really be like a light coating on top of it. So that's kind of getting you guys started with uh, soldering. Definitely let me know how your projects are going if you ever get stuck. Heck, I get stuck all the time and I post for you guys. Uh, and we've done a good job helping each other out with all this. So until next time, always post in the comments different tutorials you want to see. We do them live. You guys can sit right across the table from me, ask me questions, and you guys have been um, going. Some of you are saying, cough, cough, the fumes got me right in the face. I so apologize. So I should have told you to bring your own fan so the fumes don't go right through. Um, so <laughs> a lot of um, hi, Rachel's. Um, McGee says he doesn't speak Portuguese. Well, you know, Watch me enough and, and you'll learn. Um, how do you use a soldering wick? Okay, big mic. So there's two ways to remove solder. Say I really made a mistake and I need to remove solder off a joint or off a, a circuit board. There's two ways to do it. Probably for the circuit board, the easiest way, if I can find it, if I still have it, is, is the big thing. <laughs> so here we go. Kind of my soldering drawer here. So we have this, and this kind of looks like a medieval, like, well, not even really medieval, like you're, you're going to the doctor and you're going to get a shot or something. But you can see that it's got a plunger like that. So what you want to do is melt that solder, and then you suck it right up. So you can get yourself one of these plungers, and again, right after this stream, or if you're watching in replay in the future, uh, I'm going to have links to all this stuff with this kit. This is a Vastar. Um, it came with a whole bunch of things, tips, solder, your little solder remover. And so you were asking specifically about a wick. So a wick works in the in kind of the same way to help remove solder. So you would heat your joint up and the wick looks like a braid and you would put it on top and it sucks that uh, solder away. So I don't have a wick. Um, I've used this only a couple times, um, but for the most part, um, if you make a mistake, just cut some more wire. <laughs> that's that's pretty much what I've done rather than like, by the time you use this, you've already stripped two, two more wires and, and gotten it done. So it's going through um, uh, the, your question. So Peter Cologne is asking, hey, Rachel, I know in automotive wiring that soldering is always the better way, but is it ever okay to use electrical tape? Uh, so it really depends on what sense you're asking. So normally for uh, an electrical connection in your car, you don't really even have to solder. A lot of the aftermarket components come with butt connectors where you crimp, you stick it in the connector, and you crimp each side, and it, it kind of finishes off your connection. Those work fine. I've never had a problem with them. But over time, with all the vibrations in your car, uh, they can come loose, and then, then you're kind of stuck chasing things down. Plus, if you want that really nice, clean look under the hood, soldering is definitely the way to go. So I always recommend, rather than electrical tape, your heat shrink tubing. So uh, this is something that you would cut off. And before you make your wrap, go ahead and use your shrink, uh, heat shrink tubing. It looks so much cleaner and to the naked eye when you're just kind of looking uh, around, you barely even detect something like this. Whereas like electrical um, tape, you can definitely see that. It's also not as in environmentally resistant as something like this. This is also thicker. Uh, so this is really gonna last a lot longer than electrical tape. Although if you look in a lot of the old muscle cars back from the factory, there was a lot of electrical tape going on. So listen, it's not that it doesn't work, but if you want something that you're not gonna really have to worry about ever again, I would uh, definitely stick with your heat shrink. Much more reliable, also a little bit of dielectric grease. So you can stick your uh, wires into the rosin uh, for extra cleanliness. Go ahead and get that soldered. Before you slip on that heat shrink tubing, put a little dielectric grease. This will just help waterproof it further. And in addition to your heat shrink tubing, then you got kind of like the Hulk power of uh, 
anti-corrosion there. No water getting in at all. All right. Um, all right, so we talked about the uh, soldering out. Soldering, uh, uh, yes, the bed head wire look. Yes, <laughs> I don't really like that connection. It's just mechanically it's not as strong. I'm always able to pull it apart. I know some guys can twist them really tight and, and really well. So um, is that a classic payphone in the background? Why, yes, it is. So some of you are probably like, okay, she's like rambling, you know, so you start looking around, kind of like when you do it at a dinner party where you're like, oh, okay, we ate a while ago, it's time to go. So yes, really quickly, that is kind of one of those old time uh, phones that you hang on your wall, you collect the money, uh, and you know, I like old phones and, and old stuff, so you'll frequently see this stuff change, and then you see my uh, Texaco uh, gas pump here, it's actually converted into a light right now. So that is enough, dinner is over, who is going to pick up the check this time? time it's gonna be me so you guys thank you so much for hanging out watching asking your questions I love doing these live that way we all see what can happen in real life it's it's not edited you see some of the struggles the struggle is real so thanks so much for sitting uh, with me it helps support us a ton to get your eyeballs also we post a lot of content that we don't post anywhere else on patreon so a lot of these live things behind the scenes prepping for them is this going to work live it comes down to the moment you get to see a lot of that there it also helps support us so until next time tell me what you want to see next and we'll live stream it in 360 see you guys later